Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our speaker this evening received a Master of Arts degree from the University of Dallas in his licentiate and doctorate degrees in sacred theology from the Pontifical Lateran University in Rome. In 1977, Dr. William Marshner became a founding faculty member at Christendom College and served continuously as professor of theology until his retirement from teaching in 2015. A well-known author and Protestant convert to the Catholic Church, Dr. William Marshner has lectured widely on topics ranging from Islam to the heresy of modernism. Dr. Marshner is a renowned translator in multiple languages and is currently working on the first ever English translation of Cajetan's commentaries on the Summa Theologia. A regular presenter at the Institute of Catholic Culture, we're always delighted by his return. Dr. Marshner, the show is yours. It is a privilege to be here. And um, I want to begin these remarks by a couple of quotations from the syllabus Quantacura, which was issued the same day as the syllabus of errors, December the 8th, 1864. And the encyclical is kind of a preface, says in general terms what the many propositions to come will get into the details of. But anyway, I'm going to read you just about two paragraphs from the encyclical Quantacura, which is Latin for how many worries, how many worries, I give a great title. Anyway, there is no shortage, shortage of men, says the Pope, who apply to civil society the impious and absurd principle of naturalism, as they call it. They dare to teach that improved government and civil progress absolutely require that human society be constituted and governed without taking any further account of religion, as if it didn't exist, or at least without making any distinction between the true religion and false ones. Furthermore, contrary to the doctrine of the scriptures, the church, and the Holy Fathers, they do not blush to affirm that, quote, the best government is the one in which people do not attribute to the civil power any obligation to repress by punitive sanction the violators of the Catholic religion except when public tranquility may require it, unquote. How do you like that? There is an opening declaration which will cause a lot of patriotic Americans to wonder why they haven't heard of this before. What does the Pope really mean to say here? And uh, naturalism, by the way, you're all familiar with it. It's the modern movement in philosophy, which frankly denies that there is anything but matter and energy. That's naturalism. No spirits, no angels, no God. And the believers in that sort of position maintain that society should sever all ties or alliances or whatever with religion. And we didn't know recent examples of that about, what was it, 10 years ago, 
we had a rash of bold new atheist books in which the authors demanded this very repudiation of religion in public life. And they're still at it. They're still trying to get crosses taken down from cemeteries and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, the Pope goes on. As a result, he says, of this absolutely false idea of society's government, they do not hesitate to favor an erroneous opinion, which is as fatal to the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls as any error can ever be, and which our predecessor of happier memory, Gregory XVI, called a delirium, namely, quote, freedom of conscience and of religion is a right proper to each man, that it should be proclaimed and secured in every well-ordered state, and that citizens have a full right to a full liberty to express aloud and publicly their opinions, whatever they may be, by the spoken word, by the printed page, or by any other means, without church or civil authorities being able to check them, unquote. Okay. It sounds like he's repudiating what we know today as the freedom of the press, but it goes beyond that. He's not really after that so much as he is after the claim that the government cannot put brakes on or censor in any way the opinions of anybody, including people who advocate, um, oh, I don't know, recently we just got infanticide, but um, soon I imagine there will be in America people who maintain that select virgins should be sacrificed on a regular basis to appease the gods of the Norse pagans, whatever. And they will say so, and nobody will have any authority to contradict or reprove that kind of statement, even though it is a threat of violence. I go back to the Pope. However, in maintaining these overbold assertions, they do not take thought, they do not reflect that they are purchasing a freedom of perdition, a freedom of perdition. And that if it is always permitted for human opinion to enter into conflict, there will never be a shortage of men who insist, I mean, who resist the truth and put their confidence in the verbiage of human wisdom and extremely injurious vanity, which faith and Christian wisdom must studiously avoid in keeping with the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. When religion is banished from civil society, when the doctrine and authority of divine revelation are rejected, the true notion of justice and human rights is darkened, is lost, and physical force takes the place of justice and true rights. Thus, one sees clearly why certain men paying no attention to the most certain principles of sound reason dare to publish that, quote, the will of the people manifested through what they call public opinion or through some of such channel constitutes the highest law, irrespective of any human or divine right. And that in the political order, steps already taken, just because they have been taken, have the force of right. Okay, that last bit is known as legal positivism. It was the doctrine that tied the hands of German jurists under the Nazi regime. The regime was putting out laws. The legal positivists said, no, government made the law, and so it's the law. Nothing to do but follow it. Right? Who does not see, Pope continues, who does not feel acutely that a society withdrawn from the laws of religion and true justice can have no other end but to hoard up to accumulate riches and can have in all its actions no other law but the indomitable desire to slake 
the passions and procure pleasures. This is why men of this stripe persecute the religious orders with cruel hatred, paying no attention to the immense services they render to religion, to society, and to literature. This is why they rail constantly against them, saying that they have no legitimate reason to exist. Herein they echo the calumnies of heretics. Um, I'm not going to go any further. It goes on. It's all great stuff. But what you're hearing here should remind you of what was done to the little sisters of the poor under the Obama administration. Okay, They wouldn't agree to support contraception or abortion. And so they were going to have their tax exempt status removed. They were going to be put under various restrictions. Oh, do you remember when the Archdiocese of New York was forbidden any longer to um, have um, sanctuaries for orphans? You couldn't in New York. The Catholic Church had to close all of its orphanages. Why? Because they wouldn't give out kids to homosexual couples. <laughs> so here you have uh, permissive, permissive laws permitting people to slake every imaginable desire. And as a result, religious institutions that won't go along are persecuted. Denied access to public funds, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you may say, well, come on. This is all a couple of years ago. And uh, Pius IX was writing this stuff in uh, 1860. Don't tell me all this was going on in his day. It was indeed. Religious orders were being forced to close all over France, all over Italy which was becoming united under the anti-clerical regime of the Royal House of Piedmont. They were being closed in Spain because of liberal ministers. So this kind of persecution is not new. The Pope had watched it for 20 years and more by this time. He became Pope, by the way, in 1840. Okay. And, um, I mean, he was only on the papal throne for a few years when he was driven out of Rome by the liberal armies of uh, people who call themselves liberals. They were, uh, you know, anti-clerical, uh, anti-religious defenders of secular liberalism. And uh, they forced the Pope to flee Rome. He fled in a closed carriage. Thank goodness he got away. Anyway, nine years after Pius IX became Pope, nine years, in 1849, a cardinal named Pecci first proposed that Pius IX put forward a catalog of the errors he had been condemning already in those early years. He made up a list and submitted it to a provincial synod in Spoleto. The synod approved and sent it on to Pius IX. Not much was done at the time. You should know, by the way, that the Cardinal Pecci, who instigated this campaign, was subsequently Pope Leo XIII. Very important man. Anyway. In 1852, the Pope finally said, well, all right, let's do something about it. And he asked Cardinal Fornari to start work on a catalog of 49 propositions. He consulted other people, Fornari did, including lay people, like the Catholic apologist Louis Vargiot in Paris. And he decided to put out A catalog, yeah, but despite advice, he said, let's not put it out along with the definition of the Immaculate Conception, that great dogma that was uh, defined in 1854. So the Catalog of Errors project had to wait until the Immaculate Conception was defined. 
And then in 1861, a Cardinal Catarini uh, assembled 69 propositions. And he called on theologians to attach censures to each one. He expanded that committee. It met seven times between November and December of 1861. The 69 propositions were reduced to six. All right. Now, in January 1862, an important event happened. Over 300 bishops came to Rome to witness the canonization of the Japanese martyrs. There was a great day uh, in June of 1862, and they were shown a draft of the draft catalog of errors by this time, about 61 propositions, and they were sworn to secrecy. The list was to be kept secret, lest it leak to the press and there'd be a brouhaha and so on. But anyway, um, the um, the secrecy strategy didn't work. <laughs> Somehow the text got into the hands of an anti-papal weekly called Mediatore, which published it all. All the propositions and the censures that the theologians had thought it appropriate to attach to each proposition. Censures, by the way, are statements of how bad an error this is. Is it heresy? Is it false opinion? Is it error, etc.? So the draft catalog was published in 1862, and <laughs> the enemies of the church flew into a fit for months. This was a horrible assault on every progressive and decent and pleasant and modern idea, a horrible old medieval, didn't have the word fascist yet. Pope, he's doing this stuff. It's a disaster. Well, Pius IX was a confrontational enough guy, don't get me wrong. But he decided to hold off publication until the furor died down. He decided to pull all of the condemned propositions from his own encyclicals and allocutions. So with this new set of condemnable claims, he gave the job to a Barnabite priest named Bilio, B-I-L-I-O, who made the final collection of 80, 80 propositions. So it's ready by the end of 1862. But then more delays because of more nasty developments. In 1863, a French scholar named Auguste Renan, R-E-N-A-N, Renan, published his book, Vie de Jésus, The Life of Jesus. It was the first completely anti-religious, anti-Christian, anti-God biography of our Lord. Okay? No miracles, no God, no nothing special, just a life of the very human Jesus of Nazareth, sort of whatever scraps of the gospel he thought he could retain to get biographical information. I'm sorry, his first name was Ernest, Ernest Renan, R-E-N-A-N, Ernest Renan. This book comes out in 1863, and it was a huge success. It was a bestseller all over Europe. It went through multiple editions Lickety split. A response from the church was certainly to be expected, but when to issue one. So that was in 1863. Same year, this time in September of 1863, there was a conference gathered in Munich by the German historian 
Johann Ignaz Dörlinger, D O umlaut L L I N G E R, Dörlinger. He insisted that historical studies were not to be controlled anymore by claims or dogmas or anything from the Vatican. Human reason doing its historical research would uh, solve everything, and the church should just keep its nose out of historical, quote, science, unquote. The Munich Conference, again, required a papal intervention, and the Pope had to write a letter to the Archbishop of Munich. The letter was called Tuas Libenter, and it criticized that conference in Munich. Many propositions from the syllabus to come were drawn from that letter. Then, we're not done yet, we're only in September, but I forgot to mention something that happened in April. April of 1963 was the first Congress in Malines, Belgium, M-A-L-I-N-E-S. It was a call to the Catholics of Belgium to celebrate making peace with liberals. Now, the Belgians were in a special position to do this, okay? Because dear little Belgium, unlike poor wretched France, unlike poor wretched Italy, dear little Belgium was a place where the Catholics had enjoyed religious liberty ever since the beginning of the independent existence of the state. How did they manage that? Belgium originated in a rebellion against the monarchy in the Netherlands, uh, a repressive and nasty Protestant monarchy. The people of Belgium were sick of it. The liberals didn't like the monarchy in the Netherlands, needless to say, but neither did the Catholics. So they said, hey, let's get together. Liberals will help you found an independent Belgium, provided we get religious liberty to manage our own Catholic institutions. Well, for once, the liberals agreed. And the situation in Belgium was remarkable, unprecedented anywhere else in Europe for many years. Well, by 1863, it was time to take stock of all the advantages of the Belgian situation. But the conference became famous mainly because a Frenchman attended. Well, he wasn't just any Frenchman. He was Monsieur le Comte de Montalembert, M-O-N-T-A-L-B-E-R-T, Montalembert. He gave a fabulous speech at this conference whereupon he was congratulated by the bishop, congratulated by the king of Belgium, and it was all pretty wonderful stuff because he distinguished very carefully between dogmatic intolerance, which he said we have to have in the church, our dogmas cannot tolerate erroneous propositions, dogmatic intolerance, and on the other hand, political intolerance. That's another story. So he drew that nice distinction. And if that's all he'd done, it would have been fine. But he went on to denounce what he called the alliance between throne and altar. You've heard the phrase before, I'm sure. Alliance between throne and altar was a medieval idea and had been very popular in the Catholic Church. But, Montalembert said, it's not serving us very well anymore. Because European throne after European throne was oppressing the church, refusing it to allow, refusing to allow the bishops to communicate with their own faithful, for example. It was a bad situation, and um, Montalembert deplored it. When he got back to France, he published a brochure, a little booklet, in which he called for, quote, the free church in the free state. The church left alone, the church 
the, the state free to do its thing. It was an idea that would have quite a future, needless to say. Now, Montalembert was in trouble with Rome for giving that speech. Cardinal Weisman had been there and didn't like it. And uh, the papal nuncio to Belgium didn't like it. And so various people were telling the Pope he should condemn that Montalembert guy. The Pope hesitated, and a big friend of his named Dupanlou, D-O-U-P-A-N-L-O-U-P, Dupanlou. Remember that name. You've all seen uh, uh, Les Miserables, uh, this novel, based on a novel by Victor Hugo. At the beginning of the book, there's a very nice priest who uh, takes in poor Jean Valjean and lets him run off with the church's candlesticks because he's so poor. Well, that figure, that priest was based on Bishop Dupanlou. Okay. So he was a popular man in surprising quarters. And he interceded in Rome for Montalembert not to be condemned. The Pope hesitated. And um, Montalembert decided he had been in enough hot water. He appreciated his friends intervening for him, but he decided not to go to the second conference in Malines, Belgium. Wise decision. Okay. In December of 1864, on the eighth day thereof, December 8, 1964, the encyclical Quanta Cora and the syllabus were both published together. The syllabus was like an appendix to the encyclical. It was not separately signed or dated. Okay. As soon as the encyclical and the syllabus were published in Rome, there was an immense outcry from the press all over Europe. Every liberal on the continent, not to mention the ones over here, insisted that this was the most horrible reproach to the modern world that anyone had ever dared issue. The French press was up in arms. The most attacked propositions, by the way, want to know which ones to look for? The most attacked propositions were number 15, number 42, and number 80. We'll get to two of them by next week. And by the time we have done, we'll have seen them all. But you will see what the fuss was about. So the French press is up in arms. So what? The French government was up in arms. Now, who was the government in France in 1864, 65? Well, it was Napoleon III, so-called emperor of the French. And his administration included a ministry of justice and religious affairs. The minister put out a circular letter to every bishop in France telling them the government forbade them to communicate the text of the syllabus or the encyclical to the faithful. They couldn't publish it. They couldn't preach on it. Uh, the government would intervene with, well, with whatever it would intervene with. The same thing happened. Government silence, the government silencing the church. The same thing happened in Italy. It happened in Spain. And hey, it happened in Russia. So there you have major European powers. It didn't happen in England because the English didn't do that sort of thing. Uh, they didn't think the encyclical would bother enough people in England. But anyway, it was a bad day all over France. And um, the Ministry of Religious Affairs said the syllabus had to be stopped because, quote, it is contrary to the principles on which the constitution of the empire rests, unquote. Okay. So publication was forbidden in France. Now, 
Fortunately, the French bishops did protest. They weren't like some bishops I could name. They did protest. Things went from bad to worse until once again, our friend from Toulouse, Bishop Dupin Lou, intervened. And on January 26th of 1865, put out a booklet in which he drew the distinction between thesis and hypothesis. The thesis meant the Catholic ideal. The encyclical and the syllabus put forward the Catholic ideal. Okay? And we should all support that ideal. However, the the encyclical does not presume to tell us what we can manage in today's nasty political situation. How far can we make that ideal a reality? That's another question. And once that distinction got clear to people, the uh, fury died down. By the way, Pius IX approved that booklet by uh, Bishop Dubalou. So it was a good move. And uh, Montalembert was reassured, was reassured. Things were ready for people to calm down enough to actually read this encyclical with something like a calm mind and something like insight. Now, I'm going to begin with proposition number one in the syllabus. Okay? It says, a divine supreme being, perfect in his wisdom and providence, and distinct from the universe of things, does not exist. God is rather identical with the nature of things, and hence is subject to changes. Through these, God comes to be in man and in the world. All beings are God and possess the proper substance of God, and thus God forms with the world but one self-same thing, and so spirit and matter are the same as our freedom and necessity, truth and falsity, good and evil, the just and the unjust. What a hideous proposition, okay? I hope none of you thinks it shouldn't have been condemned. Not only is it outright atheism, in our sense of the word, But it would write into Catholic doctrine a thesis of the German philosopher Hegel. Hegel was a pantheist. Hegel maintained that God was the absolute and that he evolved, he changed, he brought out from within himself, changing historical conditions. That's how he entered into history. Okay. So the whole history of the world was, guess what? God getting his feet wet. God finding his way. And so the history of the world becomes the real revelation. You want to know what God wants? Hey, look what's going on around you. Look at current events. That's it. That's the latest revelation from on high. That's what the absolute's becoming today. All right, you got that one. Not only was that condemned in the allocution the Pope spoke at the canonization of the Japanese martyrs back in 61, it was also taken up by Vatican Council I and turned into the content of several uh, canons of that council. So proposition number one is flat out dogma. Let's look at proposition number two. It says, one must deny any action of God upon men and upon the world. How do you like that? Now, you should be familiar with the name for this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a God, but it doesn't do anything. No impact upon men, no impact upon the world. It's called deism. And it was popular at one point in the Church of England. And the Pope, again, condemned it in that allocution in 1861. You'll love number three. Here's number three. Human reason, considered in total independence of God, is the sole arbiter of what is true 
and false, good and evil. It is a law unto itself and is sufficient to procure the good of individuals and peoples through its own natural power. There it is. Okay. Flat out atheistical rationalism. Okay. Ration, human reason is the sole source of progress. It's a law unto itself, and it will deliver us all if we let it. Now then, that had been condemned by the Pope already in 1846 in a famous encyclical called Qui Pluribus. And then in another encyclical in 1862. So that wasn't a new error. That had been condemned already for 20 years. How do you like number four? All the truths of religion derive from the native force of human reason. And it follows that reason is the sovereign rule whereby man can and should acquire his knowledge, all truths of every variety. Okay. The point of that proposition was to leave no room whatsoever for divine revelation. You weren't to learn any truth that way. It was all to be figured out from reason. That was also taken up and condemned a few years later at Vatican Council I. So that's dogma. What's well, condemned? It's a, I should say it's not a dogma. It's a heresy. Proposition four. Well, let's go to proposition five. See how you like this one. This should remind you of a few, of a few modern theologians. Number five. Divine revelation is incomplete and hence subject to continual and indefinite progress in keeping with the development of human reason. Okay. Do you remember the invention of feminist theology in the 60s, early 70s? Uh -huh. The feminists said they had a new hermeneutic, a new way to interpret the Bible, which had been brought to them by the progress in history, progress of reason about men and women. And so uh, they were going to throw out many traditional understandings of scripture and put in its place a new theology, a new liberation theology. The communists had the same idea. Liberation theology, feminist theology, black liberation theology. There's been just no end of these crazy, quote, developments, unquote, of um, doctrine in keeping with the development of human reason. And the Pope had originally condemned this in 1847, when he condemned a book by an Austrian philosopher, <laughs> named Anton Günther, G-U-N-T-H-E-R, Günther, with two strokes over the U. 1861 uh, saw another allocution dealing with the same error. Okay, in 1862, the Pope had occasion to condemn the following bit of nonsense. Proposition number seven in the syllabus. The prophecies and miracles displayed and recounted in the Holy Scriptures are uh, poetic fictions. And the mysteries of the Christian faith are the upshot of uh, philosophical investigations. Mythical inventions are found in the books of both Testaments, and Jesus Christ himself is a myth. Okay. Now, we've all heard this stuff recently enough. This was in the Jesus Seminar, this kind of nonsense. Uh, it was in um, Boltmann's Demythologization Project. So this kind of stuff is all over modern Protestant theology and, alas, some Catholic theology. It has been condemned since 1862. Okay. Um, I'm very fond of a crackpot statement by the head French modernist, a Bible scholar named 
Alfred Loisy. He said, look, I'll tell you what a miracle is. Miracle is the process of nature in the world. That process, seen from without, is the study of science. The same process of nature, seen with the, quote, eyes of faith, unquote, is a miracle. In other words, the only difference between a miracle and a sci- and scientific statements is the color of the rose-tinted glasses with which you're looking at it. If you want to see something in nature through rose-tinted glasses, call it a miracle. I'm reminded of popular American songs. I believe for every flower that blooms is a miracle. Everything, every raindrop that falls is a miracle. Okay? I noticed this form of modernism for the first time at the end of the famous movie about Santa Claus. I was at Santa on 42nd Street. Is that even that thing? Anyway, at the end, the, the children are told, well, if, 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 you, if, if you can see with rose-colored eyes, you'll see the miracle of Christmas. It's, it, it, right. The next group of propositions condemned was called moderated rationalism. It isn't moderated much. Here's number eight. As human reason is equal to religion itself, the theological sciences should be treated like the philosophical sciences. Oh, in other words, no role for the church. The experts get to do it all. I'll tell you what was supposed to be moderated about Proposition 8 and the following ones. The moderate rationalists held, okay, look, divine revelation was not a bad thing because we were too dumb to figure all this out by ourselves. But once God revealed it, thank you, Jesus, once God revealed it, we could go back to the books, look at the first principles of logic and metaphysics, and figure it all out. Okay? So dogma of the church was just the success of human reason looked at in a different way. That had also been a claim of Hegel, by the way. And here's the proposition number nine, which the Pope condemned in 1862, originally. All the dogmas of the Christian religion, without distinction, all the dogmas of the Christian religion are the object of natural science or philosophy. Human reason, equipped with only an historical education, can achieve by following its own natural strengths and principles a true knowledge of all the dogmas, even the most recondite ones, provided only that these dogmas be proposed to reason as an object for study. Okay. Where did this gem come from? Oh, I'm sorry, it came from Munich. There was a professor at the University of Munich named Jakob Froschammer. He put this out, and the Pope issued a letter, again, to the Archbishop of Munich. This letter was called Gravissimas, and it was against Froschammer, 1862. Froschammer had another great idea. Okay, here's number 10 in the syllabus. Since the philosopher is one thing, and philosophy itself is another. The former, the philosopher, has the right and duty to submit himself to whatever authority he has acknowledged. But philosophy itself neither can nor should submit to any authority. (laughs) I could go on at length about that proposition, but I'm not going to. You, you see, it's an exculpation. It's a free, t- it's a get out of jail free card written by Froshama for himself. Dear Holy Father, I submit to you, but philosophy doesn't. I'm only writing philosophy here. You can't criticize that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Number 11, the church should not only ever, I'm sorry, the church not only shouldn't ever chastise philosophy, but it should tolerate errors in philosophy, leaving the task of self-correction to the discipline itself. (laughs) 
the same letter to the Archbishop of Munich. Coming off the 19th century, which was full of philosophers who did things like deny the existence of material things, because nothing existed except appearances, or denied any real difference between God and the world, like Hegel. Uh, would you like to tell me when philosophy self-corrected? When were these errors repressed? When were they absolutely finished off? I agree, they're out of fashion nowadays, but um, physicalism is still around and worse. Number 12, the decrees of the apostolic see and of the Roman congregations impede the free progress of science. Oh, gee. Can you imagine Dawkins getting a hold of that? Okay. The whole atheist crowd is just going to love Proposition 12. Oh, and this one. Number 13, the method and principles according to which the old scholastic doctors cultivated theology, no longer benefit the needs of our time and the progress of the sciences. Okay, again, I'm almost out of time. I have just spent years translating a book written in 1511 and one written in 1490 by a Thomistic commentator named Cajetan. Okay, the reasoning is so sharp that Cajetan anticipates many of the best achievements of modern analytical philosophy. He anticipates the exactitude of formal logic, uh, modal logic. Um, he thought clearly, and that is what um, modern liberals really can't tolerate. You have to believe in the progress of philosophy. Well, thank God Bertrand Russell didn't believe in the process of progress of philosophy. He threw out the entire century that came before him. Okay. And um, so did some other important pioneers of what we call analytical, analytical philosophy, thanks to whose insights I call myself an analytical Thomist. It's so much fun to get back to clear thought. Whereas, as a friend of mine once said, liberalism is a fish which only survives in muddy water. I didn't get past number 14 today. We got 15 through 18 coming up about indifferentism and latitudinarianism and their bad news though they will strike some people as scandalous. And I will take up there when I'm with you again. We've got a couple of questions that we're going to All right, I know, I'm not dismissed. <laughs> All right, I lay down my pulpit for the night, and I entertain your question. Gregory Munn was asking, history shows that trends are hard to reverse individualism, freedom of conscience, majority rule are not likely to be reversed. And I'm just going to clarify his things. Much of what we're going over here in this, uh, in these errors is uh, quite prevalent today in the thought of many. And so uh, what hope do we have that a papal decree like this can have any real impact? Or maybe we should say, what impact did this really have on God's people? I'm afraid we're going to find out. The trouble is false ideas over bold ideas, insufficiently nuanced ideas, show their poison over time. And in the end, we all suffer. I don't expect, I, do I dare say this? I don't expect the American Republic to survive another democratic administration. Okay, I think it's that bad. Once a political party is allowed to turn to socialism, well, there's something wrong with what has allowed that kind of progress of thinking. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to get. <laughs> I, I just think that we in the United States have been unbelievably 
fortunate that our founding ideas have been advanced with as much moderation as they were, with as much respect for traditional liberties as they were. So we have had a wonderful run uh, to American centuries without another ghastly Bolshevik or goodness knows what revolution. But we could easily be running out of luck. And then we will have to confront the question, where did we go wrong? How did the development of our society lead to this? How did, how did Venezuela become a socialist state? It's a Catholic country, isn't it? Well, no. Ever since it was liberated from the crown of Spain, Venezuela has been a Masonic state, an extreme liberal and anti-clerical state. Well, liberal anti-clericalism has a way of turning into socialism because if you do not have fixed, divinely guaranteed principles of right and wrong with which to correct people who only want to serve their own bellies, eventually the popular voice turns to self-aggrandization. The politic, I mean, the body politic decides to feed at the public trough. That's what happened in Venezuela. And it could happen anywhere. Well, I'm sorry, you don't want to hear about my politics. But you wanted to know why I thought this stuff was still relevant. I hope that gives you something of an idea. Kenny's unsure of the difference between Proposition 3 and Proposition 4. If you could just go over those two with us very quickly and make a distinction. Okay. Proposition 3 simply declares human reason to be omnicompetent to solve human problems, including intellectual problems, and lead us to the golden land in history. Okay. Number four throws in the idea that human reason is also what was going on in divine revelation. So as reason is, quote, progressive, unquote, so is revelation. Okay. That is a novel, that's, that's a slightly different idea. It's uh, expanding um, the responsibilities of reason. I mean, I, it's one thing to say, well, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think human reason can solve all of our problems, but I still accept divine revelation. And we couldn't have figured that out. So that you could hold Proposition 4 and accept that, but Proposition 5, you can't accept even that much. Uh, Alex Hamilton's asking a question. I know, Ray, were you ha- raising your hand there? Yeah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, but I'm going to ask this, and I'll come over to you in a second here. Uh, he's asking, what is, the, what is the weight of the condemnations or what assent is required by them as a Catholic? What a wonderfully debated question. Now, um, when I was a rash youth full of new Catholic uh, juice, I wanted to insist that the entire content of the syllabus of errors is infallibly defined. Well, it's not so. All that you owe to the propositions in the syllabus is the level of assent of the source to to the source from which the proposition was drawn. If it came from an allocution, that's just papal ordinary magisterium. If it came from an encyclical, that might be a little bit stronger. But in case propositions were subsequently taken up by Vatican Council I, then they become dogmas. But the syllabus didn't make it a dogma. The syllabus just collects what had already been said in earlier encyclicals and allocutions. And you all know what an allocution is. It's a fancy word for a papal speech. Regarding the multiplication of loaves and fishes, I wonder if you could comment on some interpretations of this text as kind of like 
you know, a moment of sharing? Is, is that kind of stuff rooted back in what was going on and what Pius IX was condemning? Uh, it's milder than what was going on in Pius IX's day. All right. Uh, but yeah, in some, it's, it's, it's at the bottom, it's the same sort of thing. Oh, yeah, a miracle. Well, with the eyes of faith, uh, you can see a miracle there. But in a story, we just see, well, Jesus touched a vein of generosity in everybody's heart. And so they all opened their food baskets and 12 baskets were gathered up of the remnant. I don't know how that can be the case. This explanation of the miracle is preposterous. But uh, yeah, it it has been advanced. Uh, It has been held by some biblical scholars to our day. And um, I don't think that uh, even Renan accepted that story. Not sure. I don't think so. Uh, In light of, uh, of Proposition 13, why do so many Catholics and clergy in particular seem to continue this uh, rejection of Thomism? I guess it's the same question we asked we get before Dr. Marstrom, which is, look, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's put in here that nobody's listening to. Okay. It's the fault of the bishops that they do not get their priests in line to recognize Proposition 13. You cannot wholesale attack traditional scholastic philosophy that way. This is something the church has said other times in other places. It's in Vatican I, it's in Vatican II even to some extent. But you cannot give this kind of wholesale rejection to all the traditional thought of the church. And that will become clearer than ever to a person who recognizes the continuity between the kind of philosophy the fathers were doing and the kind of philosophy the schoolmen were doing. Yeah, the fathers were a bit more in favor of Plato, but that was trivial. Look at the philosophical arguments brought to bear against the Arians by the Cappadocian fathers. Read those arguments you'll see the fathers of the church attacking nominalism, of all things, and arguing the way a scholastic would argue. So scholasticism is patristic thought continued, with some modification, given the change of culture in the meantime. And uh, variations like that are only to be expected, because new ages bring up different challenges, different problems. It is shocking to me, just shocking, that um, the bishops of the church have never done anything to confront what was right and wrong in analytical philosophy. It's what we've got these days, except where it's been utterly corrupted by physicalism. But what about, what about modern formal logic? What about modern modal logic? You can listen to me, who will tell you, oh, girl, Kajetan said the same, but you may not believe that. And you may believe that people who say, oh, that that modern logic, that's wrecked everything, those 12 scholastics are out the window. The Pope could put an end to that nonsense tomorrow. A question? Other than these outstanding lectures that you give, uh, Dr. Marshner, I, I, so I want to start there, but I read these and I can assent to what these syllabus of errors are. Where do I start to answer why they're errors? Do, do I go to the references? Do I pull out my catechism? Is there a book? And I'm, and I'm not discounting the lectures you're going to give in the future, but yeah. you know, how do I reason with someone? Okay. Who here reads French? The French, Paris, 1895, they put out a collection, the Recueil, the collection, of all of the papal documents of Gregory XVI, Pius IX, uh, from which the theses in the syllabus are drawn. Okay, 
you could have the whole document, the whole context. You can see what was being fought, why it was thought a disaster. Okay, to give you a better idea of what was wrong. This work has already been done. Our problem is, most of us anyway, are imprisoned in an English-speaking culture. That is to say, a culture whose language and literature have never been shaped by the Catholic Church. Okay, so our scholarship is not Catholic scholarship. It's mostly Protestant scholarship, insofar as scholarship at all. But the French, at least, had a wonderful eh, period of time when the church was being persecuted by the liberal third republic in France. And that forced the priests into a kind of loyalty to the Holy See. And this kind of scholarship got done. So the recueil of the documents of the several popes uh, up to and including um, Pius IX, uh, Paris, 1895. What's the document called, Dr. Marshner? Uh, you want the whole title, don't you? Recueil des allocutions consistoriales, encycliques et autres lettres apostoliques des souverains pontifs, ta, 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 Cité dans l'encyclique de la syllabus du 8 décembre 1864. Oh, I'm sorry. 1865, not 95. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.